everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast. We are the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Pawtucket, and all stops in between. Thank you for listening. My name is Chris Hatfield. I'm the executive editor of SoxProspects.com, and I'm joined, as always, by our director of scouting, Ian Kundal. Um, Ian, we just recorded a podcast a couple days ago. We had a long list of things we were going to get to, so we said, you know what? Let's schedule the next one right now, and we'll crank out those topics, and that'll be you know, a shorter podcast, but it'll be a good focus for our next episode. Um, yeah, no, that's not, that's not the way this is going down. <laughs> that is not what's happening. It is Monday the 9th as we record this. Um, less than 24 hours ago, I should say about 12.04, Last night, I received a text message from one Ian Cundall. <laughs> and you waking, sadly were asleep. Waking my sorry ass up to find out that Dave Dombrowski was out as the president of baseball operations of the Boston Red Sox. I think we got a lot to talk about now, Ian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um Crazy. I mean, we, we've got other stuff we're going to talk about. Ty, you know, we've, we've got. We never talked about the AFL assignments. We never talked about fall instructs last episode. <laughs> I don't think like, that's taken a back. Burn no one that. cares. We're gonna. We we may or may not get to that. I don't even know. We'll see how long this. We'll goes, see how long this, is, this goes. There's a lot to talk about and digest. There's here. a lot to unpack on this. Uh, you know, just I'll, I will defer to you to start when you heard about this at midnight last night. What were your thoughts? So I think it's kind of a twofold reaction. Um, I was not surprised he was fired or let go. I thought that was going to happen. I just was surprised a little bit with the timing for multiple reasons, which we'll get into. But I thought timing in on. what sense? Because there's two aspects. Yes, to well, timing. I said both yeah. of them. But I, the first part was I thought he was gone mostly, if, especially if they didn't make the playoffs. I just thought it would be after the season because, as we've seen with as this, in season breakups are messy. Um. <laughs> But the other aspect that really, like, I don't get it was what the way they did it at midnight, after midnight East Coast, right after the Patriots played their season opening game via, like, just reporters in the clubhouse breaking it and having to ask all the players because there was no one from the front office there to talk about it and just casually, like, dropping it, like, it just it made it distracted from the fact that this was the correct move yeah. and it made like took the focus away from what should have been like the organization has decided they want to go down a different route to god what are they thinking like they're trying to bury this news mm-hmm. like spin cycle we'll do it after the patriots news dump like quintessential john henry move i think is something i saw on twitter a lot like it is just bury the guy on the way out you know oh, try i haven't buried him but just it was like I just, guess they didn't bury him, but just like bury the news is what I was getting mm-hmm, at, mm-hmm. and that just distracted from the move, which is a necessary one for the organization going forward. And it was just one of those things that's like, does no one think about that? Like, oh, huh, is this a good idea? Let's fire the guy at midnight. Like, I, he just if they had done it today, even at like you know three o'clock in the afternoon, right? I don't think anyone would have cared. Like, it wouldn't have been like the story it's turned into about how. Everything now is about the organization's reaction. It's not about how this move and what it means for the organization going forward, which is what it should have be about because this is what they needed to do to build the team going forward. Yeah, it's now all it's about is you know they did this. The players were in the line of fire. They're not holding a press conference, so no one from the front office is or no one from the ownership group is coming out and talking. You know, there's just you know a couple blanket statements from I think you know Tom Warner, um, D- uh, Dave Dombrowski. John Henry, like they all, you know, release a paragraph statement about it. Like that's it. And then the, the, Sam Kennedy, I think also, but that's all they're getting or all they're giving. And, you know, if, even if they had just done that today, that would have been fine. It's just the way they handled it is just, I think what's distracting from, as I said, what is the correct move for the organization? Yeah. I mean, the release came out this afternoon and it's like, if that's when the news broke, then it would have made sense. But it's just it's 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 strange. Um, I just realized, Ian, really quick, I want to mention our five dollar level Patreon supporters. You can support the podcast at patreon.com slash socks prospects. We're gonna give a shout out to Sox Signatures, Kyle Costigan, 
Tyler Woodrow, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Deb Kendall, Evan Kirkwood, Hurricanes 1, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kenyon, Andrew Wallen, Lendl Martin, David B., Ben Burnett, Cy, Al Mendel, and Kevin Catrides. And as always, send your emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the midnight piece of it is weird. I, I don't know that I agree that it wouldn't have been as big of a story. Because to me... No, no, I think it would have been a big story. I think the story would have been... It would have been a little but different. It would have been, the narrative would have been, you know, the Dombrowski's out. This was the mm-hmm. move that needed to happen. Now, where do we go from here? Yeah. And now the narrative is they did this at midnight. Ownership's not doing the press conference. They left the players out to dry, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's yeah, the narrative. I guess. I mean, and I'd forgotten all about it until I read, I, I forget if it was Alex Spear in the Globe or Evan Jarelic in the Athletic, who both wrote must-read uh, pieces about this. But that when they hired him, that broke mid-game while Ben Charrington was still the GM. Like, how are they so bad at that? I just, I don't get it. But I, uh, let me speak to the other piece of timing, Ian, because we'll, we'll talk about the, the merits of the decision in a minute because that's a much d- deeper discussion. For those who are like, why did they do this on September the 8th? Why didn't they just wait till the end of the season? This gives ownership a month to find the new GM and have him in place in time for the start of the off season, which is really the most, that's when you need to have the GM there. You want the GM in place on day one, because there are team building decisions that need to be made within five days of the war, end of the world series. You know, there's minor league free agents. There's your major league free agents. Of course, you know, there, there are a lot of things. This gives them time they don't have to do an abbreviated, abbreviated search. They don't have to have the circus of what was it? Was it the manager search when they hired John Farrell? I don't remember. And it. they didn't hire him until like January or something. Like January or yeah, something. It might have been. I, I know what you're talking about. I don't remember who. It was. There was. I forget which one. If you remember, tweet us. But you know, this way you don't have that circus. You say, all right, we want a GM in place by the end of the season. Other teams are going to let that their guys are going to interview. It's going to be easier, if anything, to interview them because of the fact that, like, right now the GM ain't doing a whole heck of a lot because you can't trade anybody. You're stuck with who you've got in the system, more or less. You know, if if you added a free agent now, he's not eligible for the postseason. You know, you've got teams that are out of it and aren't going to care. So I don't think the interviewing guys is going to be a problem. I think the the you know the timing actually makes a lot of sense in that aspect of the timing on the calendar um doing it right now so you know I, the the questions about that i think that's you know it does actually make a lot of sense it is kind of a, a smart move in that respect um you know the midnight piece of it is weird i'm with you on that um the other thing i was going to say you, you, well I, I let's let's get into the well, we, should for, we should also say before we get there that they have names thus far. They, well, there's four interim. Person well, it's it's really crew. three. It's three. Well, no, it's, it's four. No, well, it's, it's three. I, I know what you're saying, but it's it's Eddie Romero, Brian O'Halloran, and Zach Scott are running baseball operations. Right, and then and Raquel, Raquel Ferreira is has Taking like an enhanced role. an enhanced role and kind well, she's, of. She's senior vice president of major and minor league operations. Right. So. And I mean, so for those who don't know those four people, Eddie Romero is probably the one we talk about most on here because he came up as the head of their international scouting operation. Uh, he's been an assistant GM for a couple of years now, I believe. Yeah. Um, when they were kind of having that brain drain a couple of years back that everyone was, was talking about and we addressed that on here that was really more of i mean they just hadn't lost anyone in so long i wasn't too worried about it personally but um he he how o'halloran and romero are both assistant gms um romero like i said came up through the international scouting operation brian o'halloran correct me if i'm wrong ian but my understanding is he really deals more with the major league side of things such as like a contract contract negotiations stuff like that yeah yeah so he he helps with putting the major league team together um and zach scott is the analytics guy he's He's the analytics head. head yeah yeah. Um, for Raquel Ferreira, she kind of, I, the way I put it is like she's the, like the chief of staff is might be one way to put it. She's the one who like 
makes the trains run on time. She's the one who like is the fixer. I mean, I don't know. I, I'll just say like in Peter Games' article today, he mentioned that like uh, uh, Raquel Ferrer did a lot of the negotiating or was integral to the Xander Bogarts extension. So mm-hmm. for what that's worth, it seems like she has been doing some more stuff. So it's not really clear, but yeah. Well, that would make sense too, because the guys who came up through the system, I mean, she's kind of like... She would have a relationship with everyone. Their godmother. Through the minor, yeah, through the minor league depart- side of it too. Yeah. So, yeah. Because she's the one who just makes sure make sure that everyone is cared for is maybe not the right word, but just tended to. Perhaps Ian might be one way to put it. Um, you know, it's it's yeah. I, I mean, that's the, but that's the crew that's kind of running things right now. But you know, the, the news had broke at first that I think Eddie Romero was taking over. I think some people thought that he was taking over as GM right away. No, they're going to have a full GM search. Um, it's not necessarily going to be an internal candidate. I think Romero will be a candidate. Yeah, I mean, that's the question I think to me is like I've seen a lot of speculation and names thrown out. And like obviously given how many ex-Red Sox front office people there are in other organizations, <laughs> yeah. there's a pretty wide talent pool to delve into there if you're going to stay in the family. And then I if mean, you're going to even move outside that, there's obviously some very interesting names with certain teams mm-hmm. that I think they should take a look at. No, but Jason but, McLeod, Mike Hazen, Jed Hoyer, Jed Jerry Porter, yeah. Emil Sade. Like, there's a ton of guys. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, and then and that doesn't even include if you know if you're going to go outside that group. Like, do you try and see if one of the Rays guys would be interested? You know, mm-hmm. like, or you know, maybe someone like uh, David Stearns up in Milwaukee. Like, you know, one of the right. younger, more highly thought of, you know, current GMs or assistant GMs. See if you can get one of them to come in to give you know a little outside the box thinking. Like, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what they do. Like, because the, the interesting and, thing was they went outside the organization to get Dombrowski, but he like didn't change anything. Well, for no, the most he part. I mean, a couple he, of his, it seems like he brought in just a couple of his guys and kind of. I mean, from everything that I've read today and from all the leaks, it seems like it kind of caused some friction because it was like kind of the more old school approach with him and some of his guys versus well, it's, and, it's Frank and then, Wren and Tony La Russa. Tony, and then, yeah, the guys who, and then there was all the people from the previous front office who mm-hmm. obviously were more like scouting player development centric. Yeah. So. Yeah. So let's, I mean, should we get into the merits here? I, I guess yeah, I think that's the big discussion. The, the, let me introduce it, I guess with, with the forum post, does that make sense to you? So, after spring training, we got back from spring training, and I, I posted the following in the staff forum on um, on the website. Um, it kind of had been thinking about some things we've been talking about at spring training. I said, wanted to workshop this idea here, but I'm beginning to think that Dave Dombrowski might not be the right guy to run the ship anymore, given the phase of team building the franchise is about to enter. I'm just not sure the creative thinking that's necessary is there. That needed to start this year, but they, understandably, decided to push in one more time with this group. The problem was that this group put them over the third CBT tier last year, and they half-assed the bullpen to stay under it while relying on health from the starters and production from the lineup to cover it and continuing to kind of suck at the little moves around the fringes of the roster. Uh, I'm still thinking this through and want to make sure this doesn't look like an overreaction to the bad starts. That wasn't after spring training. That was a month into the season. It was April 24th. That was April 24th, yeah. No, I was thinking March 24th. Uh, first of all, let me say I was not 100% right on that post. So I'm not, I'm not saying I was I think generally I think I was thinking in the right direction, and part of the reason I was workshopping it at that point. And I want to say the parts I was wrong about. I think half-assed the bullpen isn't necessarily right. I think they were constrained with what they could do, but I don't think they just – I think that they were counting on the depth that wound up coming up at the end of the year, and heck, it worked. If you we're look seeing at the like team. Darwin's and Hernandez looks friggin' disgusting out of the bullpen. Like, yeah, I mean, Brandon Workman worked. You know, Bur- yeah. Workman and Barnes became what they thought Brazier and Barnes were going to be. Yeah, Workman, Barnes, Hernandez is a legit like. Yeah, I'm cool with that. In the back that's of the three late inning guys right there. Yeah, so I, you know, I was wrong about that, I, and I don't think they. Yeah, I, mean, I was wrong about them half assing the bullpen. I think that they. I now have other thoughts about what they did in the bullpen, and we could talk about that in the off season. But um, relying on the health of the starters, I, I think, wound up being a miscalculation um, based on how hard they rode them at the end of last year in the playoffs. Production from the lineup, I think, wound up coming through. I think that just the tone they that got set in spring training, it, it was. Just, I think they just had a tough time 
getting ready. I think they just, you know, the, the starters were kind of weren't on the gas pedal fully. So I don't know. I mean, the, the lineup is obviously fine, and, and it's one of the best in Major League Baseball. Um, and I still think the little moves around the fringes of the roster. That's something I've said the whole time. Dave Dombrowski's been the president of baseball operations. It's things like, you know, as I've said, for how long now, Ian? That they don't get second players in deals. No. It's a mentality of, I want this player. What is the price to trade for this player? Well, I'm not, I'm not yeah. asking my scout who has pro coverage of that organization, where's the Brock Holt that we can add and maybe add a depth piece that the other team won't mind giving up. While he was perfectly willing to give up that player. That was the other thing for me. It was like, yeah, when you see the trades, it's like, I think the Kimbrel trade is the one that everyone goes to. And we've yeah. been talking about it I, since the day it happened. We've said this, like you're, you're already giving up two top 100 guys and Javi Guerra and Manuel Margot. You're giving Carlos Asuajes, who's a solid third piece. Why do you have to throw in Logan Allen? Who's like a high upside or at the time was, you know, a recent drafty, you know, had played what six had signed and had pitched just his mm-hmm. first half season in the league and was seen we as a very potential, you know back end starter. Why do you have to throw that guy in? Also, like I mean, I think what would the equivalent be right now? I mean, maybe if they threw in like not throw, Noah Song but Chris Murphy or no, Ryan say like Zephyr John, yeah, someone Zephyr like that. John, yeah. like he's not there yet, but he could be a guy, right? And that's like that's the guy, and it's it. I think it's not just like in trades; it's also like with signings, like. Just the depth options they get at AAA just aren't like the equivalent to what other teams get. Now, part of that's because well, there aren't options because on the major league roster, the guys they're going out and getting, you know, you're bringing back Eduardo Nunez after he's got a bum and, and you know, leg and had a terrible year. Or you're yeah. bringing back Steve Pierce this year just for who knows what. When, like, I saw Steve Pierce play this year in the minors when he was trying to rehab back. He had no bat speed. He couldn't hit an 88 mile an hour fastball. Well, that I mean, that was the injury. I mean, I, I agree with you to the extent of the major league roster. I don't know that I agree on the minor league free agents. I mean, that's where Brazier came from. I mean, well, no, no, I'm, I'm not talking about like Brazier, who's a guy. Brazier's different because he came back from like Korea or Japan or wherever he was. I'm talking different? about like no, I'm talking about going out and getting those priority like 4A guys. Like they got a couple this year, like Gorky Hernandez and like Erasmo Ramirez. But for the most part, they don't get the top ones because they don't have a path to like potential big league playing time, or they can't. They don't you know sell that to them. Mm-hmm. Like I just look at like their AAA roster a lot of the time, and it's just a lot of like you know guys who are fine in the minors, but there's no one you know there's no depth guys. You're not bringing in those depth guys that other teams can get. Yeah, I mean, I guess to me. The, the 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 one da- overarching damning thing with Dombrowski is I think the the old school non analytics not stereotype but but persona that is attributed to him is not necessarily fair because here's the thing I think there was look while Dombrowski was here. We had all the articles about them recognizing that they had fallen behind on analytics, that they were still using Carmine, which was like more than a decade old, right? And they upgraded to the Pedro system. Remember that? That was under Dombrowski. Um, that, under Dombrowski, they created Brian Bannister's position and have now built out an entire, like, basically department where it's him, Dave Bush, and uh, Sean Havland. Uh, underneath him you know there's there's that kind of thing but i think everything we've talked about is the lack of creativity and I here's what I, it, that's i think that's the biggest thing you that's can get exactly it, it's, it's like there it's there was one there was Dabrowski's way was there's there, it's a one-way street like this is the way he's going to do it and if it doesn't work there's no real plan b plan c plan d mm-hmm. yeah there's just not the analytical thinking there's not the critical thinking of analyzing okay yeah last year brian johnson and hector velasquez were both one win players are you sure you want them to be options six and seven for the rotation after you rode the starters that hard last year option eight is stephen wright who's got one knee option nine is erasmo ramirez option 10 is ryan weber I don't know that that's, you know, option 11 is Mike Schwarren, who, let's face it, we all were saying at that point, is a reliever. And, and not necessarily in a bad way, it's just that's what he is. 
you know, where was the, you know what, we're going to go spend the money, find option six, who's, you know, give them like three opt outs. I mean, maybe they tried to do that with Erasmo and it didn't work, but you know, it's, it's the, 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 around the fringes. It's just the create like, yeah, Eduardo Nunez is a great clubhouse guy. He wasn't good though. He, he's he, he had, when they first acquired him, he was hot. And he had a couple games in the playoffs last year, which thank you, Eduardo Nunez. I'll buy you a pizza anytime. But you really are going to bring back and rely on Eduardo, nu- Eduardo Nunez? Well, it was even going in the last, or did last year did he have an option that like vested or something? I can't. Well, remember. he he didn't resign. He had he he had an option. I thought. Okay. Yeah. Then, he, yeah. This year was an option. Yeah. He's resigning Pierce to platoon with Moreland. It's like that, that's that's. The one the problem it's it's like the Pierce thing, like the Nunez thing. It's like especially when you know you're so harsh up against the tax, mm-hmm. for you then to go out and devote six million dollars to a platoon first baseman who's well, it's six million what, dollars to him. What, but when you know that the that, that that position is arguably the easiest like to fill of anything, like CJ Crone gets non tendered. Like guy, mm-hmm. there's guys like that that you could get for way cheaper than six million. But just because Pierce was the MVP of the World Series, you felt like that nostalgia or whatever to bring he him back. He was there. Like, he was there. He's like um, you know he's proven it in the bright lights, I guess. But it's you like, know, Nathan Eovaldo. And the one thing I want to say too, people are crushing Dombrowski for. Well, let me start with this to everyone who's saying that Dave Dombrowski was fired for spending too much money. I don't buy it. I mean, there's this report that Evan Drella came out with that he basically had to sell the ownership on the Chris Sale extension. I don't have a problem with the Chris Sale extension. I do. I mean, why in particular? Because you have a pitcher who has is coming off a season where they couldn't finish, they weren't healthy, they finished the season pitching out of the bullpen, and you have another year to evaluate them and see if they make it through the year healthy, yet you decide to preemptively give a 30 year old guy with that delivery that much money when there's no need to he just threw 150 innings couldn't start for the last what six weeks of the year yeah i mean he's never he's literally never finished a season i think why why why, no he he has i mean 214 226 208 like he's thrown like over 200 innings but why are you you have him under contract for another year why are you not seeing how this year goes and then like, I guess their argument is, that, well, we wanted to show them the respect and lock them up ahead of time. I mean, I guess, but, like, that's just – I just don't get yeah, – like, with how fragile pitching is these days, you can't do that to a guy who's coming off a shoulder injury. Like, yeah. it just – it just is – that's just an irres- – that's an irresponsible act, like, use of or outlay of money. Mm. Like, make him – you know, have him pitch the first half, see how he throws, and if he's healthy, you announce the extension at the All-Star break. Like, do something like that. You don't do it before the season, especially when it's a five-year deal to a guy who's now with his frame, his issues with, you know, injury pass, the delivery, all – when you take all that into account, you know, you're signing him up to be 35 still. I mean – and like I understand the front office, it seems like the Lester debacle way back in the day has kind of like tainted their view on pitching. Mm-hmm. But like even look at Lester now. Look at how he's performing with the Cubs as like a thirty. What is he? Thirty six. Mm-hmm. I think Something like, like he's been terrible this year of late, especially of late. Like you can't. The the modern game has just shown that you don't. Well, give but that's year five money. of the deal, though. Well, but that's then why are you giving the, another long deal out like to sale when you already have price locked up? Like, you have all these things. Lester like, was ninth in the Cy Young voting last year, and he's still right. been. I mean, he's he's been like league average. He's he's yeah, a ninety nine ERA plus. He's not worth it. Well, yeah, but my point is just like it was just one of those things you didn't have to do, and yet you decided to give that money again when you know you're so up to like. I don't think there's any way Sale is not taking that same deal if you offer it to him after this year. So mm-hmm. why are you doing it ahead of time is my issue. That's fair. What are your thoughts on the David Price deal then? I think – I mean I didn't like it at the time. I Again, it was the same thing. Like I just don't – I just think the whole way that they the, – the, their approach to starting pitching and like the Nebraus, the way he, they've approached it is just – it's kind of like the opposite of the way the game is going. Like you look at like the Dodgers, for example, is I think is one of the more or the Rays. They're two of the more progressive organizations. I think people yeah. would say, mm-hmm. like analytically inclined. The Dodgers right now are running out two starting pitchers and just like and they're running like uh, Tony Goslin and like Julio Urias are starting and throwing like four innings in the other games. Mm-hmm. 
and like the Rays are doing their opener thing. They've turned Ryan Yarborough into like a borderline like all star. Like, <laughs> right. and his, Ryan Yarborough is like a fringy like lefty. Like, that's the way the game is trending. They're not giving like huge contracts to pitchers. You know, you're giving or the Rays they gave big money to Charlie Morton, a two year deal, perfectly fine. Right. Like, do you, would you rather have Charlie Morton right now for two years for thirty million, or would you rather have uh, Chris Sale for five years, one hundred and thirty? Like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that's and Charlie Morton's going to finish what top five of the uh, Cy Young this year. Like it's things like that that are like go more money for shorter length. You know, don't give don't give these expensive long term deals for guys like even David Price. Like obviously he was coming off a very good year in uh, 2015 when they signed him. But who were they bidding against? Like they well, were bidding the against the, him it, not wanting to come here. Mm-hmm. Like that's what they were bidding against. Right. I mean, right. They, they, that's Evan Drellick, I think, noted that they were basically bid, they were admittedly bidding against themselves to get him to sign before the winter meetings. Like, it's just like things like that are just like that's why they're in the situation they are in with. But I don't think was priced to Browse. I guess he was 2016. Yeah. Um, that's why they're in the situation they are when it comes to the CBT and the luxury tax and like. Obviously, this year, you know, it's not the end of the world when you're because they won the World Series last year. But uh, with like the picks and everything, but like the tax numbers, like it all adds up over time and like mistakes two, three years ago are not going to be felt until now. And it's the same thing going forward. Well, and this is why we had said they had a window of I think it was to this year. Because this was the year that Chris Sale was going to be a free agent. This was the year that Xander Bogarts was going to be a free agent. This was the year. Like, they had a bunch of guys. You know, last year was Kimbrell. Um, Price had an opt-out this year. Uh, J.D. Martinez has an opt-out this year. And I think that's why we thought last offseason was the offseason to get creative. You've got to put a facelift on this team. And I remember saying, like, I have no idea what they have to do. I have no idea what that looks like. But if they just let this go, it has the chance of falling off the cliff. I don't think it's done that yet. I think they've got a core in, you know, Devers, Bogarts, Benintendi, hopefully one of J.D. Martinez or Mookie Betts. Probably not both. Um, but it's just, you know, it's 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 the way that they supplement, like, you know, we we started talking about the moves around the fringes. One point seven five mil entering the year to Tyler Thornburg. That was an obvious non tender to me. I'm sorry, and even if not a non tender, even Sandy Leone. Well, th- but the thing is with Thornburg, cut him before it becomes. Uh, I mean, before it becomes guaranteed. Yeah. Like he came into camp, he clearly didn't have it. Cut him. Save the one point seven five, so you can use that during the season. But like giving Sandy Leone two point five million because because he's the Chris Sale whisperer. Yeah, like come on, like yeah. you can't give a backup catcher two point five million. Like in this day and age, that's just not a good allocation of resources. Yeah, I mean, I, I love Brock Holt. I, I would not have minded seeing them get something for him. Um, yeah, six point two five to Pierce. Uh, yeah, two point five to Leone. He's got another year of ARB next year. I doubt he's back. I mean, he, you can't tender him. He has to be non tender. No, no, he has to be. Unless, yeah, he has to be non tender because you can't resign him for a, a certain amount of, below what he's making right now. Um, but it's just like it's just like all these little things add up to the to the situation they're in now. Where coming into this offseason, as you said, they're probably going to have to decide between Mookie Betts and J D Martinez, or you know. Like they even like looking at it back at it now, like they got some like the Xander Bogarts contract looks incredible. Yeah. 20 million. Like, well, that's a great job on that. Exactly. But it's like all the benefit you get from that is wasted away when you give Chris Sale that extension. Right. Like or like, you know, or you give um, Nathan Eovaldi 17 million a year. Well, the contracts they gave out make sense if you have the next wave ready right now. Well, that's the thing because the way they're, they don't. they're they're currently constructed is like it's like a stars and scrubs approach. Not in, not in the sense in terms of contracts. That's what I mean. Hmm. I don't mean to say like the players are bad on the roster. I mean that you have you know your five, six, seven, eight, nine players making twenty five plus million, and then you have a bunch of guys making the minimum. But they don't and have like, the guys who make the. But minimum. they don't have the talent with the guys making the minimum to make that work. You know, mm-hmm. and I mean we've talked about it endlessly on the show, but. We, they don't have the pitching depth in the high minors for that to work. 
You know, right. there's no starting pitching coming along anytime soon, well, except for maybe Brian Mata, but right. he's not like, but I'm, I was talking about coming into this year, right? You know, right, they had yeah. no starting pitching coming like for this year. They had maybe Darwin's and Hernandez for the bullpen. And it's turned out that's right. But maybe Tanner Houck for the bullpen. Yeah, maybe Durbin like Durbin Feldman. Maybe those had, didn't they, happen. Yeah. Those guys didn't happen. But I think if they were contending like, Houck's up, I agree, but it's just like the way that it's just, it just, they've created such an imbalance in the organization that it's distracted from like they're they're in like no man's land right now mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. they have a couple stars under huge contracts that aren't great they have a couple stars under really good contracts they have a bunch of like a, like below, fringy to the average like major league guys making too much or making the minimum and then they have nothing to augment it coming from the minor league system like the strength of their minor league system is all the low minors right now mm-hmm. there's nothing that's going to help them next year or probably the year after like except for like a handful of guys Mata, but, you know, Dahlbeck, Duran. That's yeah it. like it's like and those the bullpen. Three, yeah and then the bullpen guys but you know like the the, the guys that are going to matter for them going forward not like other than those couple or we're talking, you have to go down to Salem. You have to frankly go down to Lowell. Like you're, we're talking about, you know, the four Lowell alarms that we've talked about and that I pre that I've praised endlessly, right. you know, you're talking about like guys like maybe, uh, Gilberto Jimenez, Nick Decker, like the bats are not really there, frankly at all, but like it's more pitchers, but that's not going to help them anytime soon. And they're still going to have these cap issues and mm-hmm. it's not like you can draft your way out of it. So yeah. So like, what do you do? It's just like, they're in yeah. such, they're in like no man's land right now. And that's, and the problem is with, circling all the way back to now bring back Dombrowski into that. And I think this was your point is, is he the one you want having to think outside the box and get creative to fix that issue? When we have empirical evidence from what he was in Miami, Detroit with the Red Sox of how he operates. I mean, the only, the only, yeah, the only trade I could think of was when he turned Granderson into who did, who did he get? Was that the Cabrera deal? No. Oh, wasn't he traded Granderson to who? The Yankees? No, I thought he traded Granderson to Miami. Oh no, that's Maven. No, they, he traded Cameron Maven. Curtis Granderson, Mister Granderson. Uh, bu- bu- bu. Oh yeah, so he was traded. To the Yankee, no. Oh, yeah, the Tigers got Scherzer in that deal. That's what it was. Yeah, the Tigers sent Edwin Jackson to the Diamondbacks. The Yankees sent Phil Coke and Austin Jackson to the Tigers. The Yankees awesome. sent Ian Kennedy to the Diamondbacks. The, the uh, um, Granderson went to the Yankees, and sh- the Diamondbacks sent Scherzer and Schlereth to the Tigers. That yeah. is an outside the box trade. Yeah. And it worked out beautifully. I mean, I, I've said it before. I think I said it on one of the recent podcasts. The fact that that Tigers team didn't win a World Series is criminal. Yeah. But I think, like, you're look like, I think, like, kind of looking at, like, the modern MLB. Like, when yeah. I think of, like, an outside the box trade, I'm thinking of, like, I think, I mean, we're going to probably talk a lot about it at the Arizona front office going yeah. forward. But, like, they <laughs> traded Jazz Chisholm, who was considered, like, a top 50 prospect for Zach Gallon. Also yeah. considered, you know, a, a really solid pitching prospect. And Gallon's turned into, you know, the, one of their better pitchers for this mm. year. And they, they, I think they've won like 12 of 13 games. They're in or the something. playoff race now, yeah. Yeah. Like they might have a better record than the Red Sox, frankly. I don't know for sure, but it's got to be pretty close. Like it's it's like that type of trade or like going to the Rays because everyone loves it. They traded Chris Archer last year when they were the, like a semi-good – they were a semi-good team last year. Oh, one, yeah. one game, Arizona's one game behind the Red Sox. Yeah. So, like, last year, the Rays, not a bad team, but at the trade deadline, they traded their best player, Chris Archer, for Austin Meadows and Tyler Glasnow, who both would have made the all-star team if Glasnow didn't get hurt. Right. And right. Shane, they got Shane Baz, too, who's one of their top five prospects in a loaded farm system. Right. Like, it's deals like that. Or, like, you know, I'm trying to think of, like, some other, like, three, like, what the Dodgers are doing. Like, their ability, that trade they pulled off with the Reds last year, remember, like Alex Wood, they got they traded Alex Wood, who could have been a contributor to their team, but they had the pitching depth to be able to trade him. And in the return, they got back two guys who now are in the top, you know, five to seven of their farm system. And what is a very uh, Josiah Gray and Jeter Downs, mm-hmm. who were and Gray was like a, you know, a converted position player in college, really loose arm athletic. And now he's a top 100 guy. Jeter well, Downs is also pushing the same thing. Like, but that was a three way trade where they more or less salary dumped, like put it yeah, this way and Alex Wood, like. Put it this way. 
What trade has Dave Dombrowski made where you think he can conf- he conferred with his uh, pro scouting guys ahead of time? I mean, I would hope all of them, but I, I no. Don't but I'm just saying, like, what player has he gotten back? Well, that's the thing. The, you know, the only one I can think of was who is it? Alejandro De Aza for someone. What was that trade? That was the, um, the lefty Gisla, Luis Gisla. Yeah, oh, and the obvious one that I'm forgetting is uh, Swihart for Marcus Wilson. Yeah, that was that's an example of yeah, that's like a decent trade and. Right. Um, because, like, I mean, Swihart's obviously had his troubles this year. Like, it's been a really rough year. Multiple on, on, and on and off. And, yeah, and that's I'm, assume, I'm sure that's impacted him. And Marcus Wilson, you know, he's not a great prospect, but he's interesting. Top but like, 20 in this system. Yeah, but that's he's, – I don't – he's not – I'm just guy. saying. Yeah, no, he's not a top 20 guy for me, but, yeah, I agree. Um, but, like, that's – you know, they don't – he doesn't do those trades. That's just not his MO. He's, you know, he's uh, – I'm going to give you four prospects or three prospects, and you're going to give me the one guy I want, and that's it. And that's yeah, not what's what the price for this guy. Right. That's not what this team needs. They don't have the depth to get anyone of note, frankly, in that type of trade. And then if you are trading, you're going to be overpaying because you're trading not established guys. You're just trading, you know, kind of like the fringy next wave of guys. And you have to, to do that. You need a bunch of them. And they don't they can't afford to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, for what it's worth. I mean, let, let's not just bury Dave Dombrowski here. I've, I make clear he did build a World Series winner. This isn't John Farrell coming in and inheriting a team that was going to win, that won a World Series in a very fluky fashion in 2013. I mean, Dombrowski's fingerprints were all over that team last year. So give him credit for that. He came in and he did exactly what they brought him in to do. Um, The other point that I actually wanted to make is that a lot of people are killing the ownership on the points we already talked about as far as timing and how they went about this, I, I get it. But I saw a point brought up about the number of GMs they've had, uh, the ownership's had since taking over the team. And I just wanted to point out, A, nobody was saying they shouldn't have fired Dan Duquette when they did. B, nobody was saying they shouldn't have – well, not they, they didn't fire Ben Sherrington. They basically they replaced him, I guess. So, but, but that's I mean they they basically did fire him. But that said, I mean at the, that point everyone was kind of like, yeah, this wasn't working. Theo Epstein left. He did. They didn't fire Theo Epstein. Theo Epstein left. Granted, there was the whole feeding the monster, leaving Fenway in the gorilla suit thing. You want to get on them for that? Fine. But uh, I mean. Theo left because he wanted to go build a legacy by bringing a World Series to Chicago after bringing one to the, to Boston. Um, you know, they offered him more than the Red Sox did. He left of his own accord. So, you know, I think there's there's things. There's forcing Bobby Valentine on Ben Sherrington. Yeah, getting on him on that for that kind of thing. But, you know, as far as the number of GMs they've had here, I don't know that that's – I think if Theo Epstein had wanted to stay, he'd still be here. Put it that way. Do you, do you disagree with that? No. Nodding, yeah. It's an audio, audio podcast. The thumbs up. Okay, thanks, Ian. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, this, you know, the, 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 the comparison in my head, it kind of reminded me of Grady Little a little bit, Ian. Uh, I don't know. Tell me, if, tell me if you jive with this. In that Grady Little was fired after losing in the ALCS. And people were like, how do you fire your manager after almost making the World Series? Well, you fire your manager almost after almost making the World Series when he's clear he's not the manager to take your team past the next level. to the next yeah. level. And that was I, – I, then I thought that was the correct decision. They're like, oh, he's, they're firing him for not taking out Pedro. No, if you watched the team at all that year, you knew why they were firing Larry Little. Dave Dombrowski's not being fired because the team's going to miss the playoff this playoffs this year. Dave Dombrowski is being fired because this year has shown that he is not the president of baseball med operations slash general manager to take this team into the next phase, to take this organization into its next phase, into its next era. They need someone younger. They need someone who will think further outside the box than Dombrowski does. And they need a GM who just will bring, I think they need to go outside the organization I, I if they hire if say if they promote an Eddie Romero, which I'd be cool with. Eddie's a friend of the website. Um, that'd be great. I think he does a great job. I think they do need to go outside the organization to bring in some people around him that that aren't necessar- haven't necessarily been here. Um, I think they need to infuse some 
thinking thinking from another organization or organizations into their front office a little bit. I don't think they need to like fire anybody. I'm just saying, you know, maybe bring in a couple assistant GMs or advisors to the GM or something like that who, you know, and Eddie Romero would be cool working with or something like that because these guys all have relationships throughout the game. So, I don't know. That's my thought. I, I, I'm, Let me put it this way. I'm cool with them promoting from within to fill the vacancy. I just, if they do that, I still want them to go outside to bring in some fresh thinking. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it it's a tough one because – like the biggest issue is the stuff that to me is is the stuff that Dombrowski was directly like most directly in control of. Like if you look yeah. at, after the talent drain in the farm system, you know, their drafts have been good these last couple of years um, yep. for the most part internationally. Um, they've found some really interesting guys for not a lot of money, frankly. And obviously they had like the extremely tragic Daniel Flores situation, which you could have never foreseen coming. Um, but you know, they found some good guys, some potential, you know, gems or keepers in that. And, um, you know, with the way they're doing it, where they just sign a bunch of people, which I fully endorse and see who sticks, you know, sign a bunch of guys for five to a hundred K and see how, how many of them are good. Um, they found a bunch of guys like that internationally, like the depth is starting to come back in the low minors and except, you know, there's no easy way to replace that depth they lost in the high minors, except for maybe one thing that we'll talk about, I'm sure in a future episode, but like, so there's no cheap MLB like talent really coming to fill the roster out. So they're going to have to get creative because they've already committed. Well, how much money is it? I don't, I don't know if you'd remember, I think it's over 125, 130 million already for next year. And that doesn't take into account, account the arbitration or like, you know, opt-ins like it's not like they're going to reset the roster they're still going to have a payroll over 200 million next year so it's just they need to bring they they need to find someone who can come in and get creative with that to maximize that money because it's pretty clear the ownership wants to reset the cbt tax so yeah and if that's outside the organization so be it but i just i just think they need to find the person that is going to get creative and you know yeah is someone who can really work with knows what they have that's why you have to keep you know a lot of the guys in the system already you got to keep that you got to keep that continuity because they're doing a good job a lot of them are it's just you need someone else to come in or you need to if or promote from within you just need you need a voice or a, a couple voices at the top who have these ideas that they can use to yeah as you said get creative and you know yeah. figure out what to do going forward yeah, um, per Red uh, at Red Sox payroll on Twitter next year, they've already got 158, um, 158 million, and that's before ARB salaries. So right, so they they don't have a lot of flexibility. You know, the roster you have right now is more or less what you're going to have to do. You have going into next year, unless you're going to go out and make some significant trade. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's. I mean, yeah. that's, yeah. Yep, I hear you. Um, I think we're good on that, Ian. Do you want to talk a little bit of Sox prospect stuff? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's, did you have any other thoughts? I no, mean, I think that kind of, that, that's, I mean, and, and I, mean, I think, I think just, just to kind of wrap it up though, like yep. Dave Dombrowski should be remembered. I mean, as much as we like, people, die. Let's, he, let's no, no, no. I'm talking about his time with the organization. At the end of the day, he did what he was brought in to do. He won a yep. World Series, yeah. and for that, he deserves to be commended. He was like, a success. He was his time. No his question. tenure at the club was a success. Exactly. His tenure at the club was a success, regardless of how it ended, because they last year they won the World Series, which is obviously the ultimate goal. And mm-hmm. things didn't go the right way this year, and obviously they decided he wasn't the man to lead them forward. But he won the. They won the World Series, and like that's all you can really ask for. So. Yep. I, I think that, you know, I don't – well, obviously we've been highly critical of a lot of his moves for this year and some of the stuff in the past. It shouldn't – that shouldn't overshadow the fact – and bringing back the same team this year, that shouldn't overshadow the fact that they did win last year and that meet ultimately, like, he was proven right. You know, the trades, while we might not have liked them, they won the World Series and that's the ultimate goal. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, let's talk some, some normal fare for, our, for this podcast. Uh, Arizona Fall League, Ian, the Red Sox have announced six of their seven players who will be heading. And it's kind of funny that this winds up getting buried because compared to most contingents that they send to the Arizona Fall League, this is as prospect-heavy a contingent to the Arizona Fall League as they have ever sent. 
it, there's no filler. Um, just for those who haven't heard, the contingent is as follows. The Red Sox are sending shortstop C.J. Chatham, outfielders Jaron Duran and Marcus Wilson, and pitchers Brian Mata, Tanner Houck, and Joan Ibar. Uh, again, all killer, no filler. Those are all top 40 prospects, at least, in the system. Where do we have Ibar at this point, Ian? Because he's probably the lowest ranked. He should he's, be top 30. He's, 30, he's 29. So that's a, all top 30 prospects in the system. There is one more pitcher who will be announced for the team later. I, I'm gonna, I, I have a, I, a feeling that it might be there seeing how healthy Cutter Crawford can get, but that's just a complete guess. That's not based on any inside information. That would make um, sense. It would make a lot of sense, I think. He, he checks the boxes because you're looking for someone who needs innings who's probably in double A or higher. So, yeah. <laughs> Either him or, or like a Jake Cozart, perhaps, who yeah. ended the season on the IL um, and is Rule 5 eligible. But, yeah, I, I mean – some interesting stuff here, Ian. Brian Mata is going to work out of the bullpen, which did not surprise me at all when I heard no, him. He's, he's it's more surprising to me that he's going. Well, yeah, you and I, I don't know if we talked to this on the last show, if it was off air. Like, his innings increase is kind of impressive. Like, for he threw 100, I want to say, last year, right at 100. Yeah. Uh, he no, 72. God, even less. 72 last year, and he's at 105 this year. So he's already 30 up. So. Like, he's probably going to throw, what, another 15, 10 to 15, put him at 120, a 50 inning like, increase. Yeah, 15 inning, yeah. That's a pretty steep increase. Usually I think it's like, you, it's, you know, 30 is around what you're looking for. But, I mean, he was throwing really well at the end of the year. That's when I saw him. Like, his last start, he, seven innings, one hit, nine strikeouts, like five walks. Yeah, also. he was strong at the end of the year, which I think is why they were comfortable doing it. Yeah, because I saw his third to last start. He was still hitting like 96, I want to say maybe 97. I can't well, remember. Well, he kind of had that dead arm period that I saw him for. Yeah, you know, he had, he had like a three, hard, a three start stretch where he went like five innings, zero innings, and four innings. Right, right. So right. I'm okay with it. And I think part of the reason, too, that you do it, just kind of thinking this through, if you want him to be ready to contribute down the stretch last year, next year, Having him pitch in September, not a terrible idea. I also think the fact that the Arizona Fall League starts much sooner this year contributes to wanting to send him because you don't have to stretch him out for a month waiting for the Arizona Fall League to start in October. Yeah, they don't have to do what they did in the past where I remember I would be down at Instructs and I would see the AFL pitchers pitching there because that's where they can get some work while they wait. Yeah, yeah. So it was just kind of awkward. I think that that allows them to send a Brian Mata. Um, Conversely... Tanner Houck is going to start, which is also interesting. What are your thoughts on that one, Ian? I mean, I'm not a huge – I get I – get, Apparently I guess, he's going to start at the beginning of next year. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a reliever all the way. Well, frankly. but here's the thing, so, too, is he threw 119 innings last year. He's at 104. That's what I was about to say is, I mean, I guess maybe if it's just him to get work and give him a chance to, like, refine more secondary pitches. But even as a starter, he's not going to be pitching more than, like, three inning stints because he's only been throwing, you know, one or two innings for the past month plus. So, like, I want to see, like, I I don't even think maybe you can check. Like, in the AFL, I'm pretty sure starters at most only go, like, four innings. Like, it's not like, you know, guys are going to go six, seven innings. So, Well, last year... Um, who was the starter they sent last year? Do, 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 like do. Matt Kent or someone? Uh, no, it was... Oh, they didn't send one because it was supposed to be Stankwitz, and he got hurt. So they didn't wind up sending a starter last year. Uh, the year before the starter they sent, wow, was Henry Owens. I forgot all about that one. Uh, and Owens got six starts and threw 21 and a third innings. Right, so it's like three to four inning um, starts. Like 2016, so they, they sent Kopech... God, and he threw 22 and a third. So we're talking the difference. It's like 10 more innings you get as a starter. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Like, it's not like he's going to be working a true starter's workload. So, I mean, it's fine. I don't really like I'm fine with him getting those innings at the end of the day. I still think he's a reliever, but yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, So it's yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Um, Duran Wilson makes perfect sense to me. I was wondering if they might give Duran a break at the end of his first full season. But again, I think it's. You know, there's definitely a certain – with him and with Chatham, it's a certain amount of, like, we want to have you used to playing this long of a season, so if we need you in September, you're ready. 
Durant also was getting better as the season went on. Um, in it, Portland, yeah. like he was getting more comfortable at the plate. So I think they wanted think to see some good sense. pitching too. Exactly. Um, and then Ibar, we've talked about recently. He he's Rule Five eligible. Yeah, that, that he's going to be. They always send Rule Five guys there. This is he's going to be the one we end up debating whether or not he gets added. This if he doesn't get traded, yeah, I could see him getting traded. Personally. But yeah, that that's the one we're going to have some debates about. I bet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, that'll be that'll be interesting. I, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Because like just with like spit, looking at the Rule Five list, it's like him. Bizardo, Chatham, Dahlbeck. That's really it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's really it. It's just those four. And Marcus Wilson, I guess, is the other one, but I, I don't yeah. think he gets picked. So, yeah, it's really just those uh, four. Yeah, I guess that's true. But, I mean, it's... Mm. Yeah, so, that's yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Ibar. Yeah, yeah. Um... The other early off season or fall slash winter uh, league of note, which isn't really even a league anymore. It's basically now a mini camp is the fall instructional league. Um, the trend across baseball over the last couple of years. Well, let's start with what is the fall instructional league for those who don't know. The fall instructional league uh, is basically teams will bring in to camp. How many guys is usually like 40 in? Depends. Like some teams are smaller, but when they used to play games, it wasn't as many. But now, well, that's, well yeah, yeah, I mean that's what I was going to say. They they would bring in about forty guys, um, maybe maybe few, maybe thirty, um, but bring in these guys and play games. It's basically extended spring training, but only with the top guys in the system from roughly, you know, the best few DSL guys up through, you know, Gulf Coast League, Lowell. And maybe a couple of young Greenville guys, a few young Greenville guys, and then some other maybe older guys who need work because they were either injured or they're learning a new position. Um, you know, you would see like a pitcher who's going from catching and transitioning or something. Yeah. Um, the trend across baseball has been to stop doing that. Mm-hmm. The thinking being. At that point in the year, guys are tired. They are just worn down and could be homesick. Have could be homesick. Having them continue to do what they have done since February, maybe not the best use of time. And I think teams have reexamined that. And the Red Sox this year are joining suit, if not. And I don't know if they chose to or the, the last team that was doing a full instructs like they were was the Orioles of the crew they play in that area and the Orioles have gone to this as well so both they're no, the Orioles left. aren't even doing that they're not having instructions they just doing in ma- oh really they're just doing they're a mini camp in, the, in January okay yeah they're doing a mini camp in January well so the Red Sox are bringing guys down it's going to be September 16th through October 7th which if you compare it to last year is about the same period same time period that it has been um and they're going to be bringing guys in on a staggered basis, and it's going to basically be a mini camp. So it, it's going to be a lot different this year. Uh, I know we're trying to figure out when the heck to send you down there. Um, so that'll be interesting to try and figure out. We'll see who's down there when you're there, because it's not going to be everybody on the roster. Um, yeah, they're changing how they do things. I don't know. Do you have any? I mean, it, I think it makes a lot of sense. Honestly, I get it. I don't know how mm-hmm. you feel. It's, no, it's I, annoying I think it's just the way. Bit, but I think it's just the way the game's trending. Um, they think that you know teams are just realizing that to maximize like their players, they need the rest, and if they bring them in January, it makes more sense because it gives them a little preview of what's to come with spring training before they report in like a couple more weeks. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, the the team will. Uh, Generally speaking, be doing the same format um, with with the spring next year. They're not doing like a January thing like the Orioles are doing. Yeah, um, they might you know they'll do mini camps and stuff early, but not nothing kind of on a large scale like that. At least if that's our understanding. Um, if you want to see the full roster of guys, you can go to the fall winter play page, which will be linked on the front page of the, of the website on socksprospects dot com. Um, a couple of interesting things, Ian. Um, 
listed as a catcher, Stephen Scott. We'd caught wind that they might do this. We well, caught in college. Um, yeah, he, I, did he catch a little bit in college? He was Vanderbilt's catcher two years ago, and then okay. they brought in a couple guys, and he just moved off. But he kept hitting because obviously that's his thing. So yeah. they're gonna, it makes sense to try I him like out it. there. He looks like a catcher. It makes sense too because it's yeah. like his his bat is his carrying, but it's like not defensively he's not great enough. at first base yeah. or left field. So you might as well see if they can make him a super utility guy defensive wise. Right, right, um, and then the uh, the other interesting piece. Uh, a, well, a couple other interesting pieces. Um, both, uh, where were they? Ryan Fitzgerald and Brett Netzer are listed on the roster as outfielders. Um, we've confirmed that's to just get them versatility. They're not moving. I mean, it would make sense because Fitzgerald can field the position of shortstop adequately at worst. Um, so, But it also makes a lot of sense to get the two of them experience in the outfield as well. Netzer is really more of a just... You know, he's going to have to be a utility guy with the way the bat's developing. Um, anything else on there that struck you, Ian? Um, I'll note that Jay Groom is not listed on the roster. Um, he will be there, but as a rehabber, which means he does not get listed on the roster. Yeah, I think that's... So that was the right. one that stood out as like, wait, where's Jay Groom? Like, it seemed pretty yeah. clear that he would be there. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Yeah, uh, I think that's really it for instructs. I mean, we'll get some reports from you when you go down there with what you see. Some interesting mm-hmm. Dominican Summer League guys there. But I said, again, check the, the roster at SoxProspects.com slash fall-winter.htm. Uh, or just it's linked on the front page. Uh, that's where you can follow all the off-season uh, new the stats, follow the Arizona Fall League, uh, stats for the foreign winter leagues, which I don't think we ever mentioned on here, by the way. Interesting thing, not really a lot to talk about with it, but MLB is not letting players under contract with organizations play in the Venezuelan Winter League, which is very interesting. They're doing it because, um, is it, I forget, is an embargo on Venezuela? That the Trump administration. Um, oh, it's imposed. they don't recognize the government currently. Oh, they don't so. recognize the government. Yeah, but I think there's their. Um, well, the, there might be an embargo. It's just that they're recognizing the you know the other government that isn't in control. So yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no, I know that they're they're prohibiting players from playing in the winter league. Uh, yeah, U.S. imposed economic embargo against the government of Venezuela um, because they that's their way that they are interpreting the embargo. Um, so that's interesting. That's one less league we'll be able to follow, and that's going to be tough because there are a lot of guys, you know, when you see these guys on social media, they list, like, pitcher, Boston Red Sox, and, you know, Tiburones de la Guerra. De, uh, sorry, de la Guerra. You know, they, they identify with the teams they pitch for back home or play for back home. So, you know, it would be interesting to pick a couple of those, those guys' brains off the record and see what their thoughts are on the situation. But... Bigger than the game, I guess, is one thing we could say in on that one. Um, so that's why there's one less league to follow this off season. Uh, I could see like the Puerto Rican league benefiting um, from that. So uh, maybe even the Mexican league. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, that'll be interesting to see how they how they do that. But that's another re- reason why like a Brian Mata can pitch in Arizona. Uh, but like last year, Darwin's and got sent, so they got rid of. The, yeah. There was a rule at one point that you couldn't pitch in the Arizona Fall League if your home country had a winter league. But it looks like they got rid of that because Darwin's and was in the AFL last year, and they got Mata there this year. So, um, Ian, really quick, we got one email. We might as well get to it. Um, Sounds good. Because we're not running over as usual, so we might as well do that. No, um, sync tonight. Yeah, well, I guess not. We just only had a couple things to talk about. Um, so we got a follow-up question from Ian McDonald, and back in February, Ian, Ian, Ian McDonald had asked us who would the top five or so prospects be, purely based on possible ceiling. And he asked, "Hey guys, um, just following up on the question from months ago." As you mentioned on the podcast, how do you see the top few prospects based purely on possible ceiling? Hopefully a fun exercise to give us something to be excited about over a longer off season. Many major changes with another season behind us. Thanks a ton. And I asked him, well, hey, do me a favor. Can you go find out what we said last time? And basically what we had agreed on, um, you had started with your list in no particular order of Tristan Casas, Jay Groom, Darwinson Hernandez, Hilberto Jimenez, Bobby Dahlbeck, 
uh, or Anthony Flores. And then we both just said, we'll leave Broom off and go with the other five guys. Uh, so we went with like Casas at the top, followed by Darwinson, um, Dahlbeck, Flores, and Hilberto basically grouped together. Um, I then said the only other two I'd have in the conversation would be Nick Decker and Danny Diaz. Mm. Interesting to look back on, right? We got to do mm-hmm. this more often. Um, what would you now say? Well, I guess the question that Ian proposed was how do we see the top few prospects based? I guess who are the top prospects based on possible ceiling now? Mm-hmm. I guess I'll start this time because you started last time. Okay. I think the number one hasn't changed. Uh, yeah, I know what you're going to say. I don't agree, but I know yeah. what you're going to say. I think, I think it's still it, Casas. I think there's two guys who have this have this similar. I don't ceiling. see Hilberto Jimenez as having the same ceiling. Oh, I don't think it's Hilberto. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Mata? Oh no, Groom. No, it's Groom. If okay. Groom's healthy, he has a seven ceiling. Well, so what did you see in terms of what his ceiling could be when you saw his start the other day? I mean, he didn't throw any changeups, so it's hard to say. That's the problem, okay. and it's yeah. always been the thing. It's like if the Jay Groom is like this is, but I'm going to keep going back until I start. Like you can't, I won't do this, and that's why he's not going to have a seven Nexus name at any point for the foreseeable future on the site. He has to stay healthy for an yep. entire for me to even consider it. Yep. Okay. But if he's rolling out like a 65 fastball, a 70 curveball, and a 50 changeup with above average command, that's like a f- number two ish to baby. Yeah. That's like a number two starter. And that's like a 65 mm-hmm. ish guy. Like, so yeah, I think it's okay. like, it's, he has a chance. Him and Costas are like similar. Cause I'm not sure Costas has a seven ceiling. I think he's like a six is like the, the top. Um, I just think Costas with an off season or two of getting his body in shape. If he really gets after it. Yeah. I think he could turn into a monster. Yeah, but I think it's those two, and then no, because I don't think Jimenez is a seven ceiling. He's a six ceiling for yeah, me. Yeah, I, I agree. They're they're the top two. The next tier for me was three guys. It's Mata. Yep. Um, Jimenez. Yep. And uh, well, I guess we're not counting Darwinson anymore, are we? No, I would say he's well. He's graduated from the rankings. He would. I wouldn't have. I don't know. Uh, I guess he could. Like, yeah, I, yeah, he could be like a Josh Hader. Like, he could be he's, a six close six he's reliever. Disgusting out of the bullpen. He's got like fifty four strikeouts and thirty innings out of the bullpen. Yeah. Um. But I guess if we're not counting uh, Darwinson, then it's only really two guys. It's Mata and Gilberto. You don't put and, uh, Bobby Dahlbeck in with that group. Maybe even a shade below it. No, because it. I just don't think power is that important anymore. Like, mm. it, it not that's not what I meant. I don't think guys with his profile are that hard to find. Like, again, I like I, this is. I hate going back to CJ Crone. I feel like I've talked about him all the time on this show. But CJ Crone this year hit or last year like got non tendered after hitting two fifty three with thirty home runs. And like, if he had as many at bats as last year, he probably had like thirty five home runs, and he's hitting two fifty five. Like. 255 with 30 home runs is something that like, or 35 home runs is like about what I could see Dahlbeck doing. Hmm. And like, that's just not in this day and age, especially with the Super Bowl, like a rule six guy. I don't know. I mean, looking at, at fan especially graphs, not at third base. Looking at fan graphs right now, if you look at the batting leaders here in September, it's kind of crazy when you look at it home run wise. There's six players already who have 40 home runs. There's another. There are 15 players who are at 35. There are, oh God, it's more than 30 now who have 30. There's 36 players who have 30 home runs, including Daniel Vogelbach, who's hitting 214. I mean, it's just. Well, that's like look at Jock Peterson. Like Jock Peterson has 32 home runs, 247, 336, 533, which is a line I could very much see from Dahlbeck. Mm-hmm. He's a two two and a half WAR player. That's a five. That's an average. That's like, you know, that's like an average regular these days. You know what I mean? God, Kettle Marte is having a season. I did not know that. But that, that's my point though. Is like power doesn't like make. A, Dang. Here, here's another example. Kyle Schwarber, thirty four home runs, two thirty three, three twenty five, five eleven, one and a half WAR player. Fran Neil Reyes, thirty four home runs, point eight. Like you have to, like at, especially because Dahlbeck's going to end up at first base. It seems the bar for him, like. Josh Bell, 36 home runs, 93 RBIs, 279, 369, 574, 2.6 war guy. 
Well, that's because he's a butcher. He's, on he's a butcher at defense, but like for, I mean, is it, for offensively though, he's a he's solid. But for like for, I mean, him could you to, see a Max Muncy? Like Max Muncy is a four win player. Okay, two fifty three, three seventy five. He's not going to do no because he's not going to do the OBP. That's um, thing, like how about like a Solaire? Two fifty two, three forty six, five forty with forty one home right, runs. That's still like a two and a half ward, which is yeah. Well, just like because a he's a negative fifteen defense right, but, on fingers. No, I know, but like I just I don't like for Dahlbeck. It's going to be tough for him to get to a six just in this day and age because the because his batting. Eugenio, average, yeah, even Eugenio Suarez is only a barely, three and a half win player. Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's just tough. And polar bear, no. What polar bear? Peter Alonso. What about him? You know, forty-five donks. You can yeah. see that. I guess it's a three sixty-eight OBP. Uh, yeah, that's like I don't. And forty-five home runs is insane. Um, yeah, that's what's just like I don't know about Dahlbeck. Like it, Jimenez could be a six. It's I think for him is the no. I just think Dahlbeck problem. could hit forty home runs. Yeah, but I'm not sure that's a six in this day and age. That's the thing for me. Um, it's not a, well. It's not by itself a six, but like the guys who are it, the guys who are thirty-five or over. The lowest WAR player is Solera, two point four. Josh Bell at 2.6. They're both brutal defensively. Yeah. Other than that, everyone is at right now a three-win player. Yeah. I mean, I just think it shows... Max like, Kepler's a four-win player. Right. So I think, okay, maybe Dahlbeck could be like a 55, but I, yeah. I mean, so he probably he would probably be my number five if we need to give five. Yeah. But yeah, there's just not a lot of guys like who have that type of upside in the system. And even like I love their draft class last year, especially like especially the pitchers. Can't put them there yet, though. Yeah, that's the thing. And a lot of them too. Even if like best case, like Chris Murphy's like a back end guy. Song's like a three four. Zephyr John's probably the same. Like Lugo. you're not. Yeah, you're not looking at like they just don't have those like extreme high upside guys yet that we know of i mean we're gonna have to see what happens with like the new the new guys coming over from the dsl etc but right now i just i think it's those four or five if you i guess those five and i don't think there's really anyone else pushing on the door right now mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well that's what happens when you don't have a true first round pick too exactly so all right well thanks for the question ian um, um well we should there's one more thing we need to discuss or we should wrap up okay uh playoffs update playoffs what do you mean playoffs salem red Sox. <laughs> they were up 2-0 and then they lost three in a row and they were eliminated by the wilmington blue rocks in the semifinals of the yeah, South that Carolina. Kind of stunk the second half socks yep they had a, it was a heck of a run but yeah they just ironically lost in the second half of their series correct um so yeah it was too done. bad went down three in a row um, little spinners though still playing, and I just realized I haven't checked on their score tonight. They so let's won, do that. They won tonight. Did they win tonight? So they are, they have split the first two games with uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Uh, let's see who, oh, so this, tonight was Noah Song, Chris Murphy. Yeah, uh, Murphy was excellent. Four Noah's, innings. Whew, yeah. Noah Song, three innings of one run ball, three innings, four hits, one run, one rock, one walk, three Ks. Um, Gave up one double, uh, and that was it. Chris Murphy, four innings, two hits, no runs, one strikeout. No, one walk. S- or one walk, six Ks, yeah. five ground outs, no fly outs. Yeah, Chris Murphy's good. They did good with that one. They did a good So, yeah, job. so Lowell's game Followed three Followed by tomorrow. De La Rosa for an inning and Jackson for, to, for an inning. Yep. Uh, who are the so, at the plate? Let's see. Alex Arrow and Big Joe had doubles. Um, offense was pretty split around. Stephen Scott had two hits as the DH. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so tonight, uh, tomorrow night's game three. And I think it's probably what Zephyr John and fly away on my Zephyr John. No, I don't think it is. It's oh, Zephyr John Aldo, isn't it? No, it'd be Groom. Oh, Groom. Who followed, Who followed Groom? Groom? Oh, YPA. Yeah. It'll be Groom YPA. Groom YPA and then Zephyr John Aldo. Well, there won't be Zephyr John Aldo because tomorrow's the last game. No, is it a best of three? I guess I it is. So. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Tomorrow night, winner take all. Yep. So I'm sure follow us on Twitter. You can follow Ian at Ian, at Ian Cundall, I A N C U N D A L L. You can follow me at SP Chris Hatfield. Thanks, as always, to our dude, Podcast Joe 2.0. Um, 
Again, patreon.com slash prospects, patreon.com slash socks prospects. If you want to support the podcast, uh, pledge a certain amount per episode, get some neat benefits there. And also make sure you check out, um, like I said, the Twitter, the website, SoxProspects.com. We're going to have plenty going on during the off season, folks. Don't stop clicking through because we're going to have plenty happening. We'll have recaps on the Arizona Fall League, the Winter League. Um, we'll have some other recappy type stuff. Maybe some scouting reports type stuff, Ian, as we update scouting reports. There will be, be scouting reports. Maybe we'll do, who knows, maybe we'll break out some position rankings. You never know. Yeah, yeah. Could so we're going to have some here. content. Depends on, <laughs> depends on how much space i can get I, i've had a backlog of reports to update for a while now um but yeah thank you and of course podcast at socksprospects.com we want to talk about what you want to hear about thank you for listening everybody thank you to our patrons ian thank you we'll be back in your eardrums next week guys Ocean.